Um, hi everyone. Um, so my name is Pete. I'm from the State Library of um, New South Wales. Um, currently acting as a systems applications um, team leader. Previously, systems applications developer. Um, you good? Can everybody hear us? It's on the desktop. Sorry. So good. Um, so I actually wrote the title of this presentation about four weeks before I uh, actually did the presentation. So I kind of tried to take the title generic, steer myself wiggle room. I don't actually go into the Exodus APIs all that much, to be honest. Uh, it's more, I, I've kind of, um, the, the presentation's more around, um, I, I do touch on it a little bit, but it's more about how we're using agile software development practices and introducing them at the library. And um, I've been on CICD as well. And um, yeah, so, but I do talk a little bit about the, um, oh, the APIs. Um, oh, how do I get it? Can I just downsize it? Okay. So basically, we're in the process of automating build, test, and, and deploy um, processes and integrating systems using Exlibris APIs. Um, we're also utilizing agile methodologies. Um, so to achieve continual improvement across the library systems portfolio. So this presentation is a brief look at the tools, processes, and techniques we've employed, employed to enable continual improvement. Um, so I'm just going to start with a very quick overview of Agile, um, taken from various websites. Um, there's probably people here who know a lot more about it than me, but for those who don't, just um, Agile is an approach to software development. Um, the basic idea is requirements and solutions evolve. They're not defined up front. Um, you have cross-functional self-organizing teams, and it's a continual improvement process. So it's an improvement to software, but also the process and communication. So you do a lot of self-reflecting on the way how things are going and you try and improve um, as, as, as you go along. Um, yeah, some va uh, values for Agile, it, uh, individuals and interactions are preferred over processes and tools. You still use processes and tools, but the emphasis is more on the individuals and, and, and interactions and face-to-face -face communication is really encouraged. Um, focuses on working software over comprehensive um, documentation. Um, we have a project management framework at our library, which um, is kind of based off print too, and it's very documentation heavy. Um, still trying to work out how we fit um, Agile software development into that. Um, but yeah, it, but Agile is really about working software is the main focus. You still have documentation, of course, but um, the aim isn't to write documentation, the aim is to develop working software. Um, it encourages customer collaboration over contract negotiation and uh, responding to change over following um, a plan. So, you know, as com when compared to like a water, typical waterfall process where you have your requirements huge document to find up front and that's what you're doing. Um, it's more about being flexible and being able to change um, throughout the whole development as requirements change and as you understand those requirements better as well. Um, so some agile principles are to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery, welcome changing requirements, um, business people and developers working together and that's something we've it's really helped us a lot. Um, so um, we we have um, we have standups with um, business owners of our software, um, and it's really by putting for the agile projects that we've done. It's really increased the communication between you know the tech and the business owners, um, and that's worked really well. Um, as I said before, it's about frequently reflecting on how to become more effective. Uh, not just improving your software, but improving your own your process, your development process as well. And again, working software is the primary measure of progress. Um, some of the challenges we're faced um, introducing the agile philosophy at, at the library. Um, I'd say we have a pretty risk-averse culture. 
in our organisation, and um, it's probably for a very good reason. But um, not that uh, I don't agile is not risky. I think it minimises risk when done properly, but because uh, it's a big change, um, it's, it's hard to get used to. Again, our existing, as I said before, our existing project management framework is very document heavy and doesn't really mesh that well with Agile, to be honest. Um, the, the traditional waterfall development process probably fits in more easily with the hierarchical structure of our organisation and the current processes and practices. Um, just one example I can give um, for a project, an Agile project working on um, earlier this year. So we wanted the business owners to do UAP before, during the sprints. You don't want to wait till the end of the sprint and then you don't complete your, um, you don't complete your story and then while well, it doesn't get done, you have to bring it back to the backlog again and then you have to do it again in the next sprint. And that was happening at the start when we first adopted it. And so we're ending up with these users, you know, for a particular two week sprint, we'd have two user stories and they'll both end up back in the backlog and then back into the next sprint because the testing hadn't been done. So, all right, we're like, okay, we need to do the, the unit testing had been done, but the end user acceptance testing hadn't. So with business, we all said, okay, we need you to test during the sprint. And so at the start of the sprint, they wanted to know what day and what time and for how long we needed the testing. And like, well, we can't tell you because we don't know. Like we, it'll be within the next two weeks, hopefully in, in a week's time over a two week sprint. But um, yeah, so they kind of had to get used to that. You have to be a bit more flexible in how you work and how you, and how you plan out your work. Um, and also it's, it requires a changing mindset. And like, I, I even within the development team, we've found this difficult. I personally found it hard. Like when we first try to do Agile, we were really just doing waterfall over and over and over again. <laughs> it wasn't really Agile. It, it, it almost, re yeah, you have to kind of think differently. And I, yeah, it's been, it's been really hard for developing software a certain way for such a long time. Um, it does require a mindset change and it's quite challenging. Um, we have had training and we've had Agile Fundamentals training and that's really helped because they take you through exercises to get you thinking in a more Agile way. And um, I'd really recommend it for anyone who um, doesn't use Agile um, methods and wants to, to get, to get um, consultants on site to give you, to do some workshops to get you thinking about it and do it, do it well. Um, okay, so this, Kind of a bit of a, a change gears a little bit, but I also think CRCD kind of naturally follows on um, and works well with agile development processes. Um, so just quick definitions. Um, when I first started reading about CRCD, I'm like, well, is it continuous delivery or continuous deployment? And you know, it's both and they mean diff slightly different things. But um, the basic idea behind continuous integration is you want to merge your code. So if you're working on a feature and um, you want to merge it back into the main line frequently. And the reason you want to do that um, is because to avoid merge, um, you know, merge conflicts and merge hell. You don't want to, so it's basically the idea of you want to be merging back into the main line branch, you know, at least daily, possibly multiple, multiple times a day. Um, so, yeah, it definitely requires test automation um, for it to work because um, you want to run your unit test and make sure they pass to ensure code quality. Um, continuous delivery is about automating your release process. So basically doing single click deploys, whereas continuous deployment is more around automated deployment to your production environment with, um, with no human interaction. Um, so basically, we're not there yet. We're not doing continuous deployment. Um, we're still doing, um, for, some, for some software we're doing, we're, up to, we're doing continuous delivery. So we've got single click deploys for some things. Um, not, not for everything, definitely not for everything. But we still are requiring a manual UAT before, um, an approval process before going into production. Um, yeah, so that's just where we're at at the moment. But hopefully we'll get to at least for some some of our software will get to continue. Um, so yeah, with the continuous deployment, the idea is you know that the CI CD server will detect a commit on the on the master branch. It will pull the code down, build 
um, build it, run tests, assuming all the tests pass, it will then deploy. So you could be deploying to production multiple times in a day. You might be writing it, you know, be coding a feature in, in the morning and you might have it on production that afternoon. Of course, this heavily relies on um, automated testing to ensure quality. And um, yeah, it really, really, it's, it's great to do automated testing anyway, but um, I think with continuous deployment, you want really good code coverage of all your unit tests and you probably want to be doing automated um, um, system testing as, and integration testing as well. Um, and be really confident in your automated tests. Otherwise, you're going to end up with bugs in production because if it's the only thing stopping the bugs getting there will be those tests. Um, so, yep. Um, so just a quick, again, a lot of people, you probably already know all this, but um, unit testing, testing units of source code, function class method, it's very fine grained and system testing is uh, high level testing an integrated system, often through the user interface, very coarse grained. Um, so kind of the lowest and the highest level, there's a lot in between as well. Um, but we're kind of mainly focusing on those two levels of testing. Um, at the moment, um, so another part of our CD, CD um, thing we use is Docker, which is um, containerization. Um, yeah, and Basically, we're using it to standardize. Um, it's a lightweight uh, containerization technology. It allows us to standardize our application dependencies across environments. So we know if it works in dev, it's going to work in staging, test, production, in theory. But it, it helps It helps you get um, you know, more consistency around that. It helps make setting up development environments easier for new developers onboarding. And it, it helps make deployment, it should help make deployment easy. Um, we're not really using it um, well in how we deploy, not, not really. Um, I want to move towards that and um, using Docker Hub to be able to, um, to bring it into that CICD process. At the moment, we're not really doing that, but that's kind of our next, our next step with the technology. Um, so CICD benefits, less bugs, make it into production in theory. Integrating code and building releases becomes easy. You spend a lot less time manually testing. Deploying releases should be click of a button, really. You release often and quickly, so therefore you get quicker feedback from your customers and you become more responsive to your end customer um, needs. So um, one particular project that I've been working on for about 18, 12, 18 months in, at the library is um, it's called Panda. And it stands for preservation and digital access. Um, so it's basically uh, it's software used to do preparation and in, in ingestion of our digital assets coming out of our digitization program into our digital preservation system, Rosetta, which is um, the Exlibris digital preservation system. Um, we we implemented we use the Scrum framework, uh, which is an, a type of agile. Um, framework. Um, it has extensive unit testing and it uses both Alma and Rosetta APIs. Um, what it basically does is file identification, file validation, file transfer, file depositing and catalog integration. Um, we're ingesting around, around 20, 25,000 files a day into our digital preservation system using Panda. Um, Design, we designed it with a headless decoupled architecture. Um, I think someone else in an earlier presentation might have mentioned something similar. So we can easily front, uh, switch out the front ends if we want to and get a nice REST API and JSON interface there. Um, the stack, the technology stack for Panda, um, it uses a distributed task queue um, called Celery. Um, so the idea is because we have to do so much processing on these huge TIFF files, um, process intensive, so we wanted to distribute the processing um, and to be able to add horizontally scale easily. Um, so it's written in Python um, and Celery is uh, backed by RabbitMQ is the distributed task queue. Um, so basically you have these workers which run on different VMs and then they, they pull down um, jobs to do and then they run them. Um, and so you can easily add new workers, uh, spin up a new worker and It'll just pick up the next thing to do and 
So it makes it really easy to scale the processing. Um, uh, we use Django web framework with a Postgres relational uh, database um, and using Angular JS for the front end at the moment, but you can easily swap it out because of the decoupled um, decoupled architecture. We actually made it a bit too efficient. We um, we used up, we have a dedicated one gigabit connection to our data center, um, our government, the government data center to the library. And we, for about five hours, we basically flooded it and brought down a number of applications that are living in the data center. So we got a nasty email from, from them, but yeah, once we, but yeah, it's, um, it's working well. So, ah, so I, I thought I'd talk at least a little bit about um, Nextlibris API. So not going into much detail, but Panda basically uses the Recipe API for retrieving bibliographic metadata. We then put that bibliographic metadata in our Rosetta submission information packages. We also embed certain bits of descriptive metadata into our, into our files, into our images in XMP uh, double core. Um, yeah, so it uses the Rosetta APIs as well, um, SOAP APIs. It uses a deposit web service to actually kick off the deposit into Rosetta. Um, then we use SIP processing web services to track the ingestion. So you don't have to go into Rosetta from within within Panda interface. You can track the ingestion all the way through into Rosetta and track it going through Rosetta. Um, and we also use the IE update web services once it's ingested into Rosetta to um, basically validate, um, to do automatic validation of all the preservation files to make sure they didn't become corrupted and the metadata is accurate. Um, so we basically validate descriptive metadata. Uh, we check that all the files that are supposed to be in permanent storage in preservation are there and that the checksums um, actually match um, the checksums um, that were generated before Panda picked up the files. So that way we know um, there's absolutely no, no corruption of any of our preservation files. Um, so here's an example of a unit test um, that's from Panda. Um, so basically Panda jobs contain a series of tasks. And so we write unit tests for every single task um, with the Python unit test module. Um, in this particular unit test, we're basically setting it up for failure. So we are creating um, an intellectual entity, which is something in the digital preservation world, it's just basically, um, if you digitize a book, then that will become a single intellectual entity, all the pages in the book and all the representations. Um, so, but what we're doing here is basically just um, uh, intentionally putting a file in there, which Panda cannot read, and then asserting there at the end that it is throwing the correct exception when it comes across that. So, just one example of a unit test. Um, we've uh, the CICD for um, Panda. What we're doing is we're using Bamboo at the moment, but we're actually moving. I think we're going to move away from it to, to Jenkins actually, um, cost and other reasons. But yeah, um, the build is triggered from a GitHub commit, pull from repo, run unit tests, create artifacts. And then if you want to deploy, um, you can deploy to different environments by just um, deploying that release into the particular environment um, that you want. Uh, the deployment's not very sophisticated. It's basically just SCPing in the files and running a bash script. Um, but this is where I want to get use Docker, Docker images better to be able to, to help us there. Um, I'm going to kind of sort of change directions again. Um, so this is, again, it's about automated testing, um, but this is about testing um, AMA. So, you know, obviously you can't write unit tests, we don't have source code. Um, we don't, so these are, there are scheduled monthly releases, we can't control when the releases are done. Um, so what we've done is we've thought, all right, well, we can, we can at least do, you know, browser-based system tests. So. What we started doing is we 
went around to all the business areas in the library and um, we started recording, um, screen capturing their critical business processes that they absolutely must be able to do um, you know, for, the, for the library to run smoothly. We then took those and we put them, we documented them into Excel files, step by step by step by step. So you know, with you know, on these tests with you know 30 steps in them. And what we started doing is we packaged these together and we started doing manual testing um, on each sandbox release. So um, we would hand these script these spreadsheets back to, to the business owners to coordinate the tests. <laughs> And they would manually run through these spreadsheets, um, make you know, doing whatever, doing acquisitions or uh, doing for fulfillment activities um, to make sure that the critical functionality worked on the new release and we could be reasonably confident um, when production comes in two weeks later, it's all going to be okay. Um, so it's, it's labor intensive, it's boring running, doing these each time. So we've begun automating these. Um, using the Python robot framework. Um, so, yeah, so this is working well. It's, um, it's requiring a lot less time for the business owners to actually manually go through and do um, these tests on each release. Um, so I've got a video of, I won't play it all, it goes for seven minutes, but um, I'll just, yeah. So basically this is, um, this is a code from robot framework um, running from the IDE. So the code is doing all this, there's no user. Um, so this is one of the scripts that we have coming from business that we have automated. So basically what happens is um, when the sandbox release comes out, we run these. And then um, what happens is um, we get back reports you know, there's, there's about 20 tests at the moment that we're um, trying to automate. I think we've automated about five or six of them. Um, but, and basically we'll get reports and that will tell us they green, they succeeded or read they failed and it'll break it down if it failed, what step it failed in. So um, yeah, there's lots of different, um, there's lots of different frameworks you can use for this kind of browser driven uh, UI testing. Um, we, we're, predominantly Python so the robot um, was a good fit for us plus our we um, a test automation engineer that we hired have had a lot of experience in um, in robots so that's why we really chose that particular framework but um, so it's all driven by keywords um, and so like for example the login functionality um, you, you write a function to define that and then you can reuse that in all your tests so, um, and you assign it to a keyword uh, login. Um, so yeah, it basically goes through um, what um, a staff member would normally do to do this business process. Um, and obviously, like we work closely with them to make sure that um, it's correct and that we're doing exactly what they would normally do. Now we get it originally from the videos, but then we show them this and demo to make sure that it is all as they do it. Um, this basically just goes through, I won't, or you with seven minutes of clicking around in AMR, but what I will show is uh, at the end of it, so it comes back to the IDE and you can see it's run the tests and it's produced reports and logs. And then we can open up the um, report, uh, HTML report and drops it on now. And there you go, so that one all tests passed. And then, but if you want more information, you can you can open it up and every single click, um, every single thing that the robot script does um, is broken down here. So that's more useful when something goes wrong. So you can find out, find out why. Um, yeah, so we're currently um, starting th these tests from the IDE manually on, on the local developers um, computer. But we want to basically um, move away from this and try to integrate it perhaps with our CICD server so that, um, and schedule it to run on just after the sandbox um, release has been made for Alma and then hopefully send us an email with a link to the report. So we come in on Monday morning and 
click the link and all tests pass or if one of them fails and we can investigate investigate why. Um, yeah, so it's been a good process. I mean, at the start, I honestly questioned why are we, question myself, do we need to be testing? I mean, shouldn't X libraries be doing all this? But, you know, our conf each configuration is different and everyone's data is different. And it's been really beneficial just by doing the process. It's actually uncovered a few things that could be done more efficiently in the business process. Because it's funny when you look at things that closely, like step by step by step, you realize, um, yeah, some sort of efficiency gains you can make. So even, and it has, it has been very useful in um, picking up issues ahead of time. And what we can do is when we find an issue, we've got two weeks. So, you know, we can either try and come up with a workaround or submit us a Salesforce case to try, if it is an actual bug, and to try and get it fixed before the production release. And it gives us confidence that when we go to production, everything's going to be more or less um, okay. So, yeah. That's it. Um, uh, how long did you set up the pipe? I mean, how long did you convert it from the manual to? Yeah, it is time consuming. Um, so we hired, uh, so we hired a test automation engineer contractor to do it for us. Um, it, the initial setup work took a couple of weeks, um, but now he's usually writing um, one end-to-end -end test script one every one and a half, two weeks at the moment. He's getting faster. So as he gets used to the Alma, because you reuse components. So as you get used to the interface and um, it gets a lot quicker. So um, it's accelerating. So um, yeah, it's taking almost down to a week for a test to be written from scratch and test the test to make sure that it's working and get the feedback. Yeah, so it gets down to about a week. <coughs> I was going to ask, just to follow up on along with that, um, so you, how, how long have you been running these tests for so far? Not long. Uh, okay. Since about March, end of March. Yeah. And, and so two things kind of came to my mind. Has Xlibris broken the test with changes in UI yet? And have your users yeah. broken the test yeah, yeah. the data in the system yet? Sorry, what was the second one? I, 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 have library staff broken the test by changing the data in your testing system? Not by changing the data, but a UI change did break the um, did, did break one of the scripts, and we had to go back and see because yeah, when the when the script fails, it could be because this is the thing kind of juggling with. It could be because of a UI change, and that's not really. I mean, it's important. It's good to know that it's helpful, and that's great, and that's a kind of a side effect I didn't really think about. But it's it's not a, the business process isn't wrong. You can still do the business process, and a human can actually still more or less do it, but. Um, yeah, it did pick up, it, it has picked up one UI change that, that did break a script, yeah. Was it because of the recovery point? Nah. I'm thinking about sustainability. Nah, no, no, it was um, yeah. really quick. Um, it's just like a, I think it took a depth half an hour to fix it and then it's working again. Because, um, yeah, um, yeah, I didn't write any of the scripts, so, but my understanding is it, it, it uses DOM to the next and um, I use DOM or maybe XPath to find the elements, but um, yeah, I think there's different ways. You can do it by some coordinates as well. So it's, I think it's a bit of a mixture. Um, so depending on, because um, we've got a really good test engineer, he kind of knows how to build it. So it shouldn't require too much maintenance. Obviously, if he's looking for an ID on a div and the ID changes, well, then he's using that ID to, to find it, well then, yeah, it's not going to find it, but, um, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. I was just going to say, how impressive that is, first oh. of all. Um, um, you use Selenium? For yeah, yeah, Robot uses it. Yeah. It can, I think, my understanding is it can use different drivers, but we are using Selenium, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but what I was really curious about was that your staff actually deem ARM as a critical system for these tests to run, whereas we don't. We use Primo as a critical system because that's the front end. We do do tests through Primo as well for um, um, for, for, uh, for, for fulfillment, but all the like acquisitions and invoice stuff. Yeah, yeah. orders, um, yeah, cataloging, all that type of thing. Um, we're testing that. Um, so what we have to do is we have to create, um, we create, it's all in the sandbox. 
we don't automate any testing or production, um, firstly, but we create these um, personas for test users for depending on what functional area they work with, and they get the same permissions as the staff. But so another thing it checks is if a permission changes, then which stops the staff member from doing something they need to be able to do, then it should pick that up as well because those personas match the permissions that we give to the staff members doing that function. But um, yeah, it, it, there's a little, we've only just started doing the Primo, just started. Um, we focus more on the AMA side of it. Um, that AMA back end to begin with, but yeah, you know, we're doing a bit more with the Primo stuff. Yeah. The only other thing I was going to say is uh, we were also confused between Bamboo and uh, Jenkins and then ended up with Circle CI. So. Oh, yeah. Well, I think Travis CI is another one I've, I've, I've looked at. We're kind of, yeah. Yeah. Do you find Circle CI a lot Easy. better? I want, to, I, want something, I want something simple, like in, yeah, in Jenkins, um, you know, it's a lot better config and you know, Jenkins, what I was trying to use is very complicated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bamboo, like, it's okay. Like, um, it, it's mainly the cost for us. Um, I think it's, it's okay once you're, just, once you're not doing a lot in it, which we're not, but because we're expanding now to do more CICD across um, more of our projects. Um, I think as you add more remote agents, the cost gets really high really quick. That's my understanding. So, yeah, can't really justify paying tens of thousands of dollars for it when Jenkins is open source and free. Um, so we're flagged with both, um, and I definitely want to look at some of the cloud. Is um so Circle is it cloud based? Yeah, I want to look at some of the SaaS ones as well. Definitely, we haven't. I'm not sure what direction we're going to go, with, but I'm definitely going to investigate those soon. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, one more question. Oh, yeah. uh, for your unit tests, yep. did you develop or do you know of an L1 lock? Or you just take, you're, you're just doing tests against Mac using the sandbox? Uh, API. Um, so those, oh, okay, so the, the unit tests in Panda that are calling, that then are then using the AMA API, I think, that's a good question. Um, I didn't write them. I think um, our developer wrote a, a mock, developed a mock object. I'm not sure though. Yeah, I could find out for you. Um, sorry. Are you willing to share? I think so. Yeah. Um, we we actually have plans to eventually open source Panda um, and the kind of the, the mini framework we've built behind it. Um, it's just that there's going to be a lot of work to do that, and we're not ready yet. But um, look, I can definitely check um, with our lead developer on it and see what they did for, for, for that. Um, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure he used, um, yeah, like I don't think we used any, um, we didn't use any like virtual <laughs> API layer or anything like that. It was all done in code. So yeah, he, he, he would use, I don't think he used a sandbox, so he must have used some kind of mock. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Yep, time to tuck in and zoom by. Um yeah, sure. Sorry, look, Sue's coming back up. Thanks everyone. <laughs> for coming to Developers Day and to the conference. Um, if you could please hand in your name badges downstairs.